So we're talking about generative fill and what sort of problems it can solve. So it's great at removing objects. Uh, you can select an object that you want to remove and then create, uh, just generate without a prompt and it basically becomes a super content aware type fill. This is one of the most useful things that I find with this. You can use it to generate objects. So if you have a product photography scene, and you need to add something in. I'm going to show you some examples of street photography where I found this helpful. You can use it to create all new backgrounds or to expand photos. And I tend to use this a lot when I'm fixing older historical photos uh, and it does a particularly nice job. So we're going to explore those different situations. So we'll start with some object removal. <coughs> uh, I'm going to switch over to Adobe Bridge. Bridge is just a tool that you can use for browsing things. And we'll do some modern photos and some old photos here as well. So I'm just going to open up a couple of selections here. I've got a raw file. I've got a JPEG that came from an iPhone. That should be fine. And uh, let's take another iPhone shot here that is a JPEG. And we'll just open those up. And I'm going to send those to the released version of Photoshop 25.0. But later we'll jump into the beta, which is version 25.1 uh, as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me just get these open. Now, of course, when we open a raw file, uh, Photoshop is going to, of course, offer a chance for us to develop that. Uh, I would suggest if you're in the raw file, take advantage of some of the useful tools that are here already. So besides just getting a balanced exposure with auto, being a touch lazy, I'm going to come down here to optics and make sure that I am applying the appropriate lens profile correction there. You see that was useful. But under geometry, we can also take a look at some of these options here to sort of line up some of the perspective lines. Now, auto didn't do a great job there, but what I can do is take the guided overlays here, and this allows me to draw a line on something that should be a horizon line, and then draw another line on something that should be a vertical. And you see how it actually fixes a whole ton of issues. Now, the takeaway here is before you start using generative AI, get basic things like the perspective correct because the generative AI will be a much better option if you have a straight horizon line. So do those corrective fixes before you start to fill things in with generative AI. All right, we're looking pretty solid here. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, open this up and I will open it without being a smart object, just a normal image there and we've got the others open as well. Now, if you guys have any questions, I welcome you to toss those questions in, be happy to see them as we're working through. So just put them into the Q&A section or you guys can chat with each other if you find stuff interesting. Now, in a picture like this, we have some basic selection tools, but I'm gonna punch in here just to make this a little bit easier. So you can take your basic tools, and just start to work within the picture. I'm just zooming a bit. And one of the tools I like is the quick selection tool. It's located here up under the magic wand. And you can drag over something to make kind of a basic selection. Now, this is great in that it will start to find things as you drag and naturally kind of get to some of the edges, right? Like so. And then if you need to remove something, you can hold down the option key if you wanted to remove it. Now, this is kind of getting us in that ballpark. You can also be pretty lazy uh, with these tools and make multiple selections, but I find that I get better results with generative fill when I start with a base selection. Now, I'm going to go ahead and expand this here just a little bit, and we'll just grow that selection a little bit and put a slight feather in so it blends. Now, you don't have to do those steps, but I find they work a little bit better. I wanna point out one key thing, which is for today's editing, other than one of the last examples I'm gonna show you, which is a really advanced example, I'm picking images that I'm flying without a net. I want you to see where generative fill works and where it fails. And we're gonna work through some live examples. So I just want to be clear that these are images that I have not pre-prepared other than selecting them and choosing a variety of problems. I picked images that we would be working with live the first time on purpose. So now I'll say generative fill. And you have to agree to the terms of service. This is connected and powered by Adobe Firefly. 
which is a large database of images that are uh, trained a lot from Adobe Stock, but also other images that Adobe has access to. You have to opt in. Uh, and now, if I don't have a prompt in there, I could just click Generate, and it will analyze it and attempt to remove. Now, this is going to do a solid job. It's going to think, and depending upon the resolution of the image, it can take a little while. Now, in this case, that's interesting, right? Like, let's look at what it did. It decided that we needed some pillars in here, <laughs> and it added reflections. Now, that's interesting. I don't see anywhere else where there's pillars, but it probably saw some of these signs and other things. They don't look out of place. The reflections on the wood are quite nice, but I want to point out that you have options or variations here. So as you look, they're giving you choices of putting things in. Now, one of the things I want to point out is that the people that Generative Fill makes don't work often. <laughs> So especially you'll see a lot of non-faces here. Look at sort of these generic hands. Um, I don't recommend them. They're not meant to be like placeholder people. What they really tend to be is like background objects or if you've ever seen uh, drawings or architectural illustrations where they're putting in uh, fake people in a backdrop. But we can step through some different options here. And if we need it, we can continue to just hit generate and it will make more. So you see that those get uh, there. So let's just tear this tab off and put it over here where there's more space to work with it. And with each time of generating, it makes additional options. So it found a, a railing, it found uh, a desk to fill in that space. So it's quite interesting, some of those choices. And again, each of those is on its own layer. I'm gonna throw that away. And this time I'm gonna say select and I'll just reselect the previous selection. And in Generative Fill, I'm gonna say Remove People. Now normally, just doing it with no text is gonna come up with a good option, but you can actually tell it that you wanna specifically remove something, and you'll see some additional results. Now there, I actually got the result I wanted, which was don't put some random thing in there that wasn't there. But I love, look, we actually have a suggestion of what is this person doing, cleaning the floor? <laughs> and there's that podium again. It loves the podium. But this is the one I want, and it's great that there's variations. Please tell me you're at least moderately amused at what AI thinks the human mind wants, right? So I was thinking remove people. It was thinking, let's put a podium in. People like speeches. They're great. You guys are a very quiet audience, but that's okay. So uh, as you can see here, we can go through. And again, you can also step through the options here very quickly or click to generate a handful of new ones and it will run and you'll be able to pull those together. Thank you, Korea, for having a laugh. At least one person is having a better day. So there you go. You could step through those options. I really like that one with the background removed. Now, we can keep selecting more people here, but one of the things I want to point out is do them in waves, right? So think about this. These people are closer here, so I'm going to say remove people and run that. It's going to go faster if you make a smaller selection, and because we had different depth levels here, you're going to get better results. So rather than just selecting all of the people, that actually did really nice. Look at that. It filled in the person back there and it took that statue and sort of filled it in we're doing okay now these are all on a similar plane so i'll just make a selection here there we go and we'll say remove people again let that rip let's see how it does not bad so think about this here we got an architectural shot without having to clear out the museum. So if they wanted to show off different areas but not have to close down this museum, even with all of this highly reflective wood surface, we were able to believably remove people here. And as you can see, each of these is on its own layer, so you can start to stack those up and sort of see the transformation. Now, I want to point out and look closely here we have this area on the wood and what i'm not sure on is how much of that is a shadow and how much of that is wood discoloration 
So I'm going to make a separate selection here around that texture, respecting the line. There we go. And just click Generative Fill and Generate and let it analyze the texture and fill that in. But this is one of those things to be careful of. You want to pay attention to things like shadows and reflections. So if we toggle that on and off, that actually looks a bit better. I got rid of that very faint shadow that was there from the people passing on. All right, I'm going to do an older example here in a moment, but does this make sense how we were able to very quickly remove things that were distracting? And it could be all sorts of things. You know, it doesn't have to just be objects or people. It could be unwanted signage that you have or perhaps logos or brands things. Now, I have nothing here against the Mariotta family and their great contribution to this museum, but I just want to illustrate that it's pretty smart when it comes to textures and it should be able to preserve that wood grain quite nicely. And again, we do have different options here that we can do. That was beautiful. So much faster than having to clone all that out. Really impressed with that removal of that object there. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Let's jump on over. I'll just save that project here. There we go. And we'll just capture that as the work. Save, perfect. Save that as a layered TIFF file and I can always come back to the layers. And here is a similar example where we have some street photography. Now, same thing, if you've opened up a picture after the fact, I wanna point out that we have a really useful tool here called Adaptive Wide Angle. Now, what's cool about Adaptive Wide Angle is you can draw lines on things that are supposed to be square. So I'm gonna take this here and actually draw around this sign. Okay, so I can go in, I'm gonna get it wrong at first. And we've got those basics, let's zoom in here a little bit. But once we have that object here, we can kind of go around the actual object itself and start to select these different points and move them in a little bit, okay? Now, by doing so, what I'm doing is finding something that should be a square this is the Cinerama sign. And then you can actually click on some of these and use that as a point of reference. Or you could take these lines here, the constraint tool, and let's just zoom out a little bit. Where we're getting some curvature here, we can go up along a surface like this. There we go. And then when you click on that line, or if you grab it, you could start to rotate that line to compensate for any angles. Now let me take this box out really quick. There we go. And you see that it adjusted. Now let's do this side of the street and I'll do the building here, that edge. Click. Make sure we're on the regular line tool, not the polygon tool. There we go. So click and down. And this is the adaptive wide angle tool. If you shift click on that line, it will try to straighten it. The red line indicates that it's not quite right, but it's close. And I would just move that until I get a green line. And then I'll do the horizon here. And again, shift click. All right, now let's say you had done something like that and you just have these extra areas outside. Well, watch this. We can fill that in. Command click. And then I'm just gonna say select inverse. And again, generative fill. And we'll just hit generate. And it's gonna evaluate those missing areas and attempt to fill them in. I did this extra step and a lot of the tutorials that are out there skip these things because they don't really know what they're doing when it comes to all the other tools in Photoshop. Generative fill is super easy to use, but tools like advanced wide angle are not. But the benefit there of that advanced wide angle is look at how we are able to fill in some of those missing areas, which is cool. Now I see we have a little bit more room there. So I'm gonna say select, and I'm just gonna expand that. So you can modify it and expand that. So it's a little bit bigger. There we go. And let's just run that again this time on the empty area. Generative fill, generate. 
and I just trying to push it to get into those boundaries a little bit. But sometimes you will see just a little bit of slippage there on the outside. Uh, does it automatically create a layer? Yes, it is going to automatically create a layer when you run these tools. So there's the two different options it generated. I actually like this one better. Uh, and that's because it needs to go on its own layer. But you see there is a mask here. So if you needed to, you can actually zoom in to that layer, click on the mask, and start to paint with your paintbrush tool. So you can hide or blend those areas in. So there I'm painting, I'll put that back to 100% opacity, but you can start to paint in those areas and decide where they mix. And once I zoom in there, it actually did fill in that pixels, which is good. So sometimes there's a reason to zoom to 100% to check the accuracy. Now we've kind of got some cool things going and I'm just going to remove a few objects. So you could take a tool and lasso around the garbage that you didn't want to see, right? Just select that, generate, fill it in. And this is a pretty complex selection here. We have an angle of the building plus the ground there meeting. And let's zoom into that to really explore. So here we have different options. And it's pretty impressive. Notice how it did a solid job. I think this one's actually probably the best. I'm looking at that line there, and none of these are actually perfectly straight. I mean, this is a pretty beat up building, but it's nice that we can go through. And if you find one you like, they actually give you a chance to vote on it. So you could tell them what you like, and that actually helps give them feedback to make the AI better. You know, So we can go through and deal with things we don't want in the scene. Now, one other way around this is to just kind of get a little lazy. And so what we can do here is make our quick selection tool and just kind of drag through here, right? So I'm just making a, a basic selection and kind of getting in that general area. Now, notice that was not on the layer itself. So you'll get a better job if you start on the actual layer. Let's deselect there. And what I'm doing is just kind of selecting some of this pavement here, right? There we go, not bad. And we'll get that garbage can and just subtract a little bit of the building. There we go, and the parking lot up there. And now I'm gonna type in just a few prompts. Add pools of water with some dull reflections and let it rip. So I see that there was already some water in here. I just kind of want to play off some of that and see how it does. Not bad, right? <laughs> now here's what's cool. It's on its own layer. So here I like a lot of this, but I think this one's better. Now, it kind of put a little fake ledge in there, but that's actually kind of working for me. We've got this one here, not bad. I want to point out that it has its own mask. So if you grab this here, we'll just put this on a higher layer. I can grab my paintbrush, click on the mask, the black and white area, and use my brush. So I'm just getting a nice big brush. There we go. Adjust the softness of the brush and lower the opacity just a little bit, right? So we can click on that brush and not bad. And we'll just take the density down and brush. So here we go, B for brush, nice and big. There's our feather, good, good size, good. And so now I can start to brush there on that different area. Let me just undo really quick here. What did I do? There we go. So take it and brush. And so I'm just painting with a little bit of white here to bring some of that back and see how I can, in this case, add to the mask, putting the reflections in. Then I can switch on over to black and I'm just going to play with this brush a little bit here. Let's click on black and go a little bit more to a gray. 
And so now as we brush, I'm kind of mixing the two states together, brushing in some of the other content that was there. And as I go along here, along this edge with the garbage, I could just brush that in a little bit, right? There we go. And so by mixing the opacity together, we can kind of build that up, which is cool. Now let's just click on that mask there so it's not disabled. And I like it, right? We're seeing a little bit of that great. Let me lower the opacity there to 20%. And so I can brush in a little bit more of the sidewalk texture that was originally there. And I'm just gonna get a nice big brush. And so what I'm doing is painting with 20% opacity. And do you see how some of the original street is coming back through? That's pretty cool. Now let's just come over to this garbage bag here and brush more of that back in. There we go. And that's one of the things that I would suggest is by using the masks that are here, you can really introduce some opacity and you can see how we mix that in, right? I can see exactly how that's brushing in there and I could just brush in different amounts of opacity so that that reflection is totally believable because the reflection should probably be not quite so strong. There we go. And we'll turn that back on. What do you guys think? Is that making sense? Reflections are pretty cool. Just don't make them look totally computer generated. Mix them with the layer that's underneath and you can get some pretty cool results, right? All right, I think that makes sense. I wanna go on to some other examples. Um, you could use this to do all sorts of cleanup, right? Like, you know, we are uh, hired to like photograph uh, a place. We can make that selection, generative fill, let it analyze, just hit return. And it's gonna try to deal with some of those unwanted objects. Uh, you can deal with unwanted shadows and use this on generative fill. Uh, this is where I would definitely experiment with the different options there. Like that's a lot better, right? That one looks definitely better. Come on over to here, make that selection. In this case, get the shadow, right? A little bit more, there we go. And generative fill, press return. We'll let it analyze and it works great. And you can actually take out shadows and other unwanted things pretty well with this tool. So. Yeah, not bad. Step, step, that one should do it. And remember, don't be afraid to zoom in if you need to and toggle those results on and off. You can always also, when you're done, here's a little trick, press a new empty layer. And if you come on over here and choose a tool like the spot healing brush, you could tell it to sample all layers. So I've got this little line over here in the ceiling that I don't want. I could just brush over it and it's gonna use an additional pass of AI to fill that in. But this time I'm just brushing and it's so much faster because you can just fill that stuff in and you can brush over little imperfections like I'm doing there. See, and that's on its own layer. So while generative fill is great, don't be afraid to use the old spot healing or healing brush but a cool trick is to use sample all layers and keep it on its own layer. And it's really simple to uh, brush things in. So you see there, we removed a distracting modern element that was introduced into uh, this photo of the mission in Santa Barbara. We took out the modern track lighting to see this look more like it would have in a previous age. Okay, cool. All right, let's keep going through some more examples. I hope you're finding this useful. So we talked about removing objects. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Again, select the objects and then let generative AI get rid of it. Generally speaking, just leave the selection blank and hit that button and let it prompt. And then you can take things out. Generating objects. This can be tool too. You can make a selection, access generative fill, and then type in a text prompt. Okay. So this one could get a little tricky. Uh, but let's do a few options here. And I'm gonna go in here. This will be a good one. And uh, we'll open that one up. And let's also do one of these skies and here. So these are all three raw files and I'm gonna open these up. Let's go to the released version of Photoshop, version 25. 
And we'll go ahead here and just do a little recovery. Get the sky right, that's good. Bring that white point down just a little, not bad. Using our curve tool, I could take the on image tool and really target the adjustments. I'm gonna go to the blue channel and just pull that down slightly. Here, same thing, let's do a recovery, try to bring back that sky, not bad, uh, but we could change that, right? And then here we have a photo, there we go. Those are all good, let's just open these up. All right, so when we're working with these, in this case, I open them up as smart objects, that means that the underlying object there can actually be adjusted, right? But let's go here and make a, a rough selection. You know, let's say we had our two turtles looking and we wanted them to be interacting with the subject. So I can come over here, make a rough selection and type things in and say, uh, lake fish lifts head. And we'll prompt. Now, we can get some strange options here and the key with generative is you gotta try different prompts. But there we go. I think that's the wrong angle, but you know, that's like a jumping fish. <laughs> but we're not seeing it break the surface, right? Like it's not sure where to put that. So I could say here, um, you know, fish sticks head out of water. And we'll see how it does. What's nice here is with each prompt, it is tracking things. So you can see that, you know, we have our previous results. And it still seems to be going down the same path, but that one's actually okay. So I'm gonna take that one and use it, but remember, it's got its own mask. So first off, we can look at this and decide, is it in the right place, right? Like it created a prompt there, that's fine, it blended it, but here's the actual mask on it. So I'm gonna hit B for brush, take that mask there, and brush in a little bit of those gray values, right? So now the fish is going below the surface of the water, right? I'm just brushing in here with that, and that helps. Additionally, let's zoom in a little. We could take this object here, besides blending it, there we go, just paint with a little bit more opacity, and there we go. So it looks like it's coming from below the surface a little bit. There we go, see I'm just blending in the different amounts. 10, there we go. Perfect. I can then click on the fill layer itself and grab a tool like the blur tool, right? So you can see you have your sharpen tool, your blur tool. Now we can go ahead here and it wants to be rasterized, which is okay. That means that it's no longer a smart object, but we can defocus that area that was supposed to be more under the water, so it blends in more with the pixels around it. And so that's just some of that basic compositing type things you should think about of making things a little bit more believable. Okay, cool. All right, let's go here and uh, take advantage of one of the other tools. So notice we have different selection tools here, right? Select subject, we'll attempt to analyze the subject. Well, Photoshop does a really good job with select sky, right? So we have different options here, select sky. And I'm gonna say, you know, this just doesn't feel right. So I'm gonna change this to say, orange sunset, low drama. Now let's see if it picks up the word low correctly or if it just puts drama in. Sometimes AI is a little bit not a good listener, but we'll check. And we'll let it do. And notice what it did there is not only did it select the sky, but it then tried to blend and it creates new stuff for that blending. Now, one of the things that I feel here that's interesting is I'm not exactly crazy how it decided to make the mountain there. So you see, if you have too precise of a selection, sometimes that's problematic. So let's actually undo, and we've got our core selection there. This time, 
I'm just going to select the entire top of the image like so and try that same prompt. Replace sky orange sunset faded. Let's spell that correctly. Now, this can get a little tricky and Photoshop does actually have its own sky replacement algorithm that's separate from this. It just is something to consider here. You'll see the differences between precisely making a selection and loosely making a selection, right? So it's different is what I'll say. So if you really want to preserve an area up there, you might want to take a look at some of the more advanced options and you will actually find that there is an option to replace sky. So you can use this as a starting point there. See sky replacement under edit and it will attempt to find it, right? And then you see how it's putting it there and it's starting to output. But what's really cool is besides these changes, once this is done, it's going to actually output things here to new layers. See, there it did it. So now here's the cool trick. We're going to turn this off for a second and we're going to make that basic selection, right? I could have done it with select sky. I just did it this way. And I'm going to say uh, generative fill and we're going to say early dawn sunrise return. Now it's going to make that an attempt to fill it in and it's going to put it on its own layer, which is what we wanted it to do, right? So we'll give it a second. Not bad, right? A nice gentle blue sky. Kind of nice, not too bad. But here, watch what's cool. Instead of it randomly putting new trees in for me, I could just take this layer here and I am going to take this mask up here, command click to load it. And then just come down here, we'll throw this mask away. And with that new selection up there from that one, we'll just add the new layer mask. There it is. And if I want, I can even drag this into this group. So what's cool here is that you can actually start to do some of that and mix those two together. Right, so I was able to steal that and put it in and have it be better masked. And here's that edge lighting group, right? You can actually go in there and modify. And so you've got adjustment layers here. You can tweak the edge and the transition. You can go in and deal with the overall lighting levels there on that transition and make small refinements. And so it's pretty cool that you can actually tweak that. And there was the one I'd done before. So I just want you to see that these different AI tools can be used together so that you can generate things like the sky, but not have it put random stuff in that you didn't want by still just applying a new mask to it. Does that make sense to everyone? Like you can still override things. All right, let me do a more complex example and then a basic example. Let's go back to bridge. And I uh, hope you guys are holding up okay. I want to show you how we can work with some older pictures and do some extensions, right? So sometimes we'll have older photos that have issues or pieces of the picture missing, right? So here we go. We'll just open up a bunch of old ones and send to Photoshop. There we go. Okay. So when you have older photos, and there's pieces missing, uh, there's a few things we can do. So we could just say, hey, I wanna go to the canvas command, canvas size, and just extend this, right? So let's extend this by 150% in each direction, right? It's gonna go ahead and actually do that and give you those options. And so now it's pretty simple to just, you know, make that basic selection. There we are. And I could do generative fill. And it's going to look at that and attempt to create more of the pixels that are going to fill in those missing areas. Now, normally I would do this in pieces, but it didn't do bad. We have a little bit of an edge there, but that's pretty easy to blend. Remember, you can select that because it's just the mask. Grab your paintbrush tool and let's just paint. 
right? So you can go in there on that mask itself and blend those edges a bit or zoom in and just use that healing brush, the spot healing brush we talked about. And on a new empty layer, just brush over some of those problem areas like so. So useful with older photo restoration. Now we got pretty aggressive here with the set extension. And I'll point out that this has a texture to it, whereas the newly generated pixels don't have that same texture. So if you're gonna do this with a restoration, you're either gonna have to blend those edges pretty gently or reintroduce the error that you see here. So in this case, I'm gonna make a new layer a texture layer in this case. So we'll just come on over and click on the bottom for the fill layers. Those are the adjustment layers. And then we have here uh, different options. Let me find where texture is. New, there we go, good. And let's just fill that. And we can choose pattern. And then there's different options in here. Now you can load paper textures and everything else. This is not going to be a perfect texture, but I'll put that in there for a second. This is obviously trees, but I'm just going to point out that even with something as simple as this, let's just mask that. Let's blur this a little bit. Got our layer selected, filter, blur, motion blur. There we go. See, I'm getting a little bit of texture back in there. Strip the color out and then we can blend that, right? So see how it's starting to mix nicely, right? We'll just put that in different mode, soft light's good, lower the intensity. And obviously, if you just spent the time to find a slightly better texture, but even there, that's definitely helping. So I did that really quick, but there's a myriad of old textures out there. You could find print textures and others to kind of weigh in but that just makes that look less computer generated. So it's a good way to kind of fill that in a little bit. Okay, but this is gonna happen all the time. You're gonna have pictures where there's pieces missing or there's parts of the photo, right? So it's pretty cool how we can actually do that, right? Now, one of the things I wanna point out is this is not a miracle worker. So let's rotate this here. Uh, we'll just turn that clockwise. Math is apparently not my friend today. There we go. And let's grab the crop tool here. And we're just going to extend this a little bit. And we're going to open this one up. And so here, it's giving us an option now called generative expand. And I'm going to say uh, nothing. We'll just let it analyze. <laughs> but we could have been more specific on the faces you're gonna see it tries to come with, with new faces. So it's gonna fill in the missing areas and it guessed. Well, that is not my mother who wasn't there to begin with. That is not my grandfather. And that doesn't exactly look like me either. Although it's not awful. A little more 1970s hair, but that is definitely not my grandfather. But as you see here, if these were background players, it's interesting. Who's this random guy? <laughs> So I love AI sometimes. You can see some really random results there, but it's a starting point. And it did a great job of filling in the texture and showing me where the face would go. And then what I would do is go in and find an additional photo of my grandfather and bring it in. So in this case here, this is not uh, the same time period exactly, but it's a starting point, right? And so you can go in and start to work with things like this. Let's just get a basic selection here. There we go, right? And make a selection. And then you can start to move some of that content in. Now, obviously not the exact right resolution, but my point here is that you can find something from a similar photo and use this as a point of reference. See, it's giving me a size object back there that I can use. Now, what I'm going to do before I do that transformation is this. And usually I would have a higher res photo, not a lower res photo, so I wouldn't be scaling up as much. But watch. Lower the opacity for that layer. Let's drop that down to like 50%. 
and press Command T for free transform. Now what we can do as we scale is use the generated object back there as a point of reference. So see, I'm placing it so that the eyes, the hair, the ears are in the right ballpark, right? So now as we're working with that there, we can get things into the general right area, like so. And then it's just a matter of adding your mask and starting to blend. So you'll be able to play with that there, take your mask and start to blend the objects in like so. And so see there, I'm bringing back the collar, right? And I can start to mix that in. I can go in and start to clean up the ear and the hair. And I'm doing this very quickly here. So this is not a, a great final result. But what's nice here is you have that. And then remember, you can just come down here, take something really simple and take that face back out, right? So it was just there as a point of reference. So I can use that there and just start to remove that using the surrounding pixels. And I'm just using the spot healing brush there. You can grab your clone stamp tool, any of those just to fill that in and start to get those pixels taken out. And then as you layer that object on top, you can then continue to work with that, blend it, match it, etc. If I just do a little bit of skin tone matching here, pulling down the saturation and the lightness, you could see that we're starting to get into the right ballpark. Now, I could do much more to blend this together, but I just want you to quickly see how the generative could be used as a point of reference to fill that content in and give you an object that you can use as you're mapping new stuff to it. All right, let's do one more picture. And in this one, it's a photo that I was happy with, but there was a challenge. So here is the photo where I developed it and it was okay, but you see how these are a bit blown out. And when I open the light up all the way to get the great starburst effect, these are really blown out. So let's open up this raw file here and I'll show you what I did. First up, let's just get this in the right ballpark and using the geometry here, I'm going to go ahead and tell it to fix the verticals. Not bad. And I could do a, a true grid. That's way too much. We can try auto for balanced, none, some, definitely helping. But if you want to do those guided lines, you can go in and draw your own lines on what you consider to be the verticals and it will start to straighten. And let's do that there as well and not bad. So now I've given it some points of reference. Again, I can shift click to force that line or grab it and just move it ever so slightly and start to get that into the ballpark. All right, so now we'll open that up and bring that in. Using the missing areas here, select, we can then inverse that and grow it just a little bit. There we go. And let's do generative fill. Now, normally I would do this in smaller passes, but we're doing this quickly. If you want better results, don't do as many areas at once, but let's push the limits here because we're working on a time deadline and I want you to see what's there. Can you upload images similar in mid journey? No, not yet, but I would sure love that when we get to that point. Uh, notice there, not bad, right? It did a pretty good job of filling in the missing areas. But the part that's really distracting me here is these lanterns. I'm very unhappy how blown out they are. Now I could go back to bridge and, you know, go into my raw file here, you know, come in, find one where it was better developed, work with that, you know, open up that raw file really try recovering the exposure, you know, bring that down. Sure. And, you know, we can kind of get there, but look at it, it's still clipped and crushed. So I'm just going to go ahead and try working with what we have. So what we can do bear back in Photoshop is step into those areas and make a basic selection. So I'm just going to choose the photo layer, grab my quick selection tool, 
and click making a basic selection. Now, if you really want to be precise, what's nice about this is, you know, you can start on your layer there. You can start to select. Not bad. Click again. Not bad. Hold down the Option or Alt key if you want to subtract. And then what I'll often do is press the Q key for Quick Mask. Now I can see exactly what's being selected. This way, I could press the Brush key and precisely control, right? Smaller brush. Let's not have such a soft edge. There we go. And so we can bounce back and forth between black and white here and paint to get exactly what we want for those edges, right? Until I have the actual lanterns more or less selected, right? So not bad there. Now, in this case, what I'm going to do is then press the Q key to exit and just make that a touch bigger. Select, modify, expand, 10 pixels. Now, I suggest before you leave that, jump on over to channels and save a new channel from selection. And that's an alpha channel. That's just so I have it later in case I need to reload it. Now, we can come in and say, hey, uh, paper, lanterns, orange, generate. And it's going to analyze and make some variations. And there's different choices here, right? Now, remember, each of these are trying, but I can go ahead and say, oh, you know, let's add another word, round, or better yet, oval. Let it analyze think and it will make new ones and each one of these starts to give me some new choices right and so now this is interesting let's say ridged run a few more and it will just keep making more options until you find something that's closer to what you want See? And then remember, once you've added that, don't be afraid to play a little bit. So I'm going to come over here, duplicate my background layer and bring it up. And in this case, we're just going to reload that previous selection. There it is. Now on this top layer, I'm going to mask it. That put a copy above what was getting added in. Now we can just start to lower the different blending modes, find something simple, right, see, and start to lower the opacity down as well. But you can pick up elements of those previous ones and start to mix. You could play with your blending modes and everything else in here, but it's fun because now the colors are mixing a little bit. And then in this case, I'm going to select those paper lanterns and it's already a smart object. So let's just apply a little bit of a blur. So we'll do a very small blur. So they're just not so perfect. There we go. Uh, two pixel blur makes those feel a little less computer generated and it's fitting in nicely. And remember, what's cool is that this is still a smart object. So you're still free, even though you did that blending and that blur, to play with different options. You can keep making new ones in the live Photoshop file all day long without being locked out. So you can come back and after you saved your PSD, revisit this. Like this is actually much cooler and closer to what I want, right? And then I could say, well, I was in Taiwan here, so I'm gonna type in Taiwan symbols and let it analyze again and see if it comes up with anything better. So. What's cool here is that you haven't actually lost your work, right? There we go. That's probably the winner. Or maybe that one. <laughs> it's kind of cool. I think this one works for me. And I love how the blur stayed attached to the smart object. And by being more descriptive of my scene, I can mix that in. And now it's fitting in the scene.
We were able to use AI to fill in some of the missing areas. We used tools like upright and lens correction to balance this out, which is pretty cool. And then uh, let's just do this here really quick. This one's pushing it a little bit because we are in a downtown urban environment, but I'll just make a, a basic selection there. And uh, let's just grab our polygonal lasso and we'll try it for good measure. Let's see, generative fill, uh, starry sky urban. And let's see how it does. Now it's probably gonna be too strong and I wouldn't actually do this in reality, but it's a fun place to end because we're wrapping up our time. And I wanna point out that as you play with these different options here, see, there it is, star, starry sky urban. You could still play with the stacking layers and actually play with the variations. And so there it put a gentle sky in there. I kind of like that one. I'm just gonna lower the opacity. There you go. And you can play with where does that fall within your stack. And because it's got its own mask, it's super simple. If it put it in a place where it didn't belong for you just to paint over anywhere where it doesn't belong. So just click on the mask itself. There it is, B for brush and you could start to brush in and remove that or play with those areas. Again, pretty straightforward. All right, let me turn that off for now and we'll take that full screen. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed looking at these different options. So as you saw here, we can generate objects, we can generate backgrounds, we can fill that all in and we did the expand option. Just take your crop tool and drag things out. So as you learned, you can go in and take an old photo and expand the scene or even a new photo and you could start to add more to it. So just hit C for crop and expand it. And as you do, and there we go, generate, you can actually let it analyze the photo and come up with additional pixels so you can change the aspect ratio, which could be useful if you're shooting in tight situations or had only certain coverage that you had with your lens. All right, if you guys have any questions, toss them in. I appreciate you guys coming out today. I know there's another class getting ready to start, but uh, this tool is a lot of fun. And as you see there, there's a whole bunch we can do with it. I think you guys can check this out and the options here are really cool. Now that it's been released into the main version of Photoshop, it is actually cleared for commercial use. So you are free to use all the images it produces in your projects. Thanks guys so much for coming out. I hope you had fun.